Welcome to Exposure Controls. In this section, we are gonna be going through all the ways that you can control the exposure on the camera, simple things like shutter speeds, apertures, ISOs, but we're also gonna be looking at a variety of other tools and features in the camera in order to help get you the correct and best exposure in any situation. So let's start with the mode button and the quick control dial two, the mode button and mode dial, I call it. This is how you're gonna be switching through the main functions on the camera. Now, if you press the info button, after you have pressed the mode button, you will be switching between stills and video, and that is the easy way for changing between the still portion of the camera and the video portion. They're very different uh, ways of functioning the camera. I will be having a special section just on the video operation of the camera. And so it's pretty easy. You press the mode button, hit the info button, and boom, you're in movies. If you are interested in a even faster shortcut, a one, but one button solution to get from one to the other, I'll be showing you that feature and customization when we get to the video section. But for now, we're gonna be talking about the stills portion when it comes to exposure. A lot of this though will apply to movies as well. So you're gonna press the mode button. You can turn any of the dials to change the modes on it. We have a lot of different modes to talk about. We will start with the simplest of them. The scene intelligent mode is the fully automated mode where the camera sets shutter speeds, apertures, ISOs, as well as a whole bunch of other features. And it also limits what you can get into within the menu system. And that's gonna be kind of nice if you ever hand your camera to a friend or a family member who doesn't really know about this camera and doesn't know about photography and you want them to take simple basic photos and not mess up any of your important settings on the camera. And so it's, it's good, as I say, for that mode. I don't think too many people who own this camera are gonna shoot in the scene intelligent mode themselves because it restricts you from so many other things that are going on in the camera. Now, the camera does make some basic exposure adjustments, as I mentioned, shutter speed, aperture, and ISO. It's looking at a number of things, and it's a pretty smart program. That's where the whole intelligent auto thing comes by. And what it's doing is it's looking and trying to identify what you're photographing and trying to make adjustments for it. And it has a number of different concepts and subjects that it can identify and will adjust for in appropriately. But it doesn't really go far enough from a longtime photographer's perspective. Let's just say you're, you're down at the sports fields and there's a sports game going on, basketball, football, soccer, doesn't matter and you point your camera at the subjects, the camera will probably figure out, oh, these people are moving around. Uh, let's use a faster shutter speed. But it may not set a fast enough shutter speed. It may not set the motor drive as fast as you would like it to go. So it's good for simple, basic things, but it's not good for sophisticated work of the camera. So we do have a lot of limitations in that regard. Now, the Q button on the back of the camera is our shortcut to the quick menu. It's a shortcut menu with kind of the main features that you might want to change in short notice. And so let's take a look on this camera and we'll go ahead, fire this camera up and throw a little focus on that. Just make sure it's nice and clean there. We'll hit the menu button and actually we're going to hit the Q menu button here. And so with this button here, we will turn the back dial of the camera and we don't have too many options here. Uh, so we have our drive settings. We can dial over and select a motor drive mode or a self timer mode. Single shot is fine for now. You can choose different JPEG options and gotta be careful with that one. Um, we can also go into the movie mode. We're not gonna do that right now. We'll save that for a little bit later. So as you can see, there is a very limited control when it comes to the Q menu in this regard. Now you can also use the touch focus and face detect. So let's go ahead and take a look in the back of the camera now. And if we wanna focus, you can see that the camera is already identifying the photograph of the face over here and is tracking that eye movement back and forth. If I bring out something else to focus on, we'll put it right there in the middle, I can touch that to focus. I can choose where I want the camera to focus in any particular place and it will just focus there. And so we can also come down here. There's a little symbol down here. It's uh, the touch shutter is turned off. And now you can have this set up so that it actually focuses. Back to live view here. 
focuses and takes a photo. And so you can turn this feature on and off. So it's either focusing or focusing and taking a photo. And so it's pretty easy to switch back and forth between those by just touching the screen like that. All right, the next mode that we want to talk about is the flexible value mode. And this is the one mode to replace all modes. This is the future of photography, in my opinion. Now, a little hard for me to switch over. I'm very used to using manual and aperture priority and some of the other modes on there. But this is the one mode that does manual, does aperture priority, shutter priority, program, all in one, and it simplifies the process in many ways because it allows you to set manual or automated control of all the key components when it comes to the exposure system. And so when you do this, you'll be selecting with that mode dial which option you want to control, and then by turning the main dial on the camera up on the front, you can change where that particular setting is at. And at any given time, if you want, you can press the garbage can button to make that particular feature automated, or you can hold it down to reset the whole lot of them into an automated control. So this is something that I gotta show you. So let's go ahead and dive into this. So press the mode button, we're gonna change over to flexible value. Right now, everything's in automatic. It's in a full program mode with the addition of ISO also being in auto, so we can just take photos and their basic simple exposures. If we said, you know what, we wanna make some adjustments. Let's change our shutter speed. Well, we turn this main dial on the camera, the mode dial, excuse me, mode dial to change between our different exposure options. And we can cycle back and through any way we want. If we wanna change our shutter speeds, we now turn the main dial up on the front of the camera and we can choose a specific shutter speed Let's just say we want to shoot at a 60th of a second, all right? The camera chooses our aperture and our ISO. Notice where those numbers are now. If we said, no, we want to shoot at 500th of a second, notice how, well, the aperture hasn't changed, but the ISO has in order to get a proper exposure. Let's go back down to a 60th of a second. Let's dial over to the aperture. And if we want to change our aperture, you'll notice that the ISO, because it's automated, and you can tell because it's got a line underneath it. Here in the aperture values, if we hit the garbage can button, we'll make it automated, and it has a line under it. As soon as we start turning the dial, you see where the orange dial is? That's the setting that we're changing. If we want to change ISOs, we go over to the ISOs, and we can start changing the ISOs. So now we're in full manual, and we can tell because there's no underlying settings among our three main settings there. We can change our shutter speed, come on over to our aperture, and we can finish the touch up with the ISO wherever we want. Now, if any one of these three is in an automated mode, let's just do that with the ISO, press the garbage can button, and it becomes automated, we can then come over to exposure compensation, and we can make our picture lighter and darker using this system. Now, let's just see what happens. If I leave this at two stops underexposed, I come back over to the ISO and I start changing it, the exposure compensation automatically kicks back to zero because there's no exposure compensation when you're in full manual. But now, just to see what happens, if I throw this back into automated, that has reset the exposure compensation to zero. And so this is one of the features that I think is a little confusing to somebody who hasn't played around with it. And I know the first time I played around with it, it just, it seemed a little bit weird. But as you get used to it more, this is the one mode that can really replace pretty much everything. If you're the type of person that does occasionally jump back and forth between program, shutter priority, aperture priority, manual, and you've got to make all these other adjustments because you're switching back and forth, this is a faster way to work. And I think, I think for the kids out there, this is the mode I would work with because you can do kind of everything with the least amount of button presses and that's just gonna help you out down the road because you'll do everything a little bit faster. Now, when you are in this mode, like many of the other modes that we're gonna be talking about, the quick menu is a quick way to jump in and make some of those 
most obvious and important settings. This is something we're gonna discuss in detail in section eight, but let's go ahead and just take a look on the camera real quickly. We are in the flexible value mode. Just as a reminder, we're gonna hit the Q menu and we're gonna dial around this with our back dial on the camera. If we wanna jump into a particular feature and make a setting change, we can just turn with our main dial and we're gonna be talking about everything you see in here as we go through the class. We're not gonna stop here and do it. But the quick menu is a great way to just jump in and make a lot of quick changes in there. Now there is no customization of the quick menu. Canon, please, could we? Maybe someday in the future. Firmware update, yeah, do that. Uh, but it's a good place to find a lot of those standard features. No matter how much you've customized your camera, you can always go back to the Q menu and find a lot of those core features. All right, program auto exposure. This is where the camera sets shutter speeds and apertures and nothing else. So you get to control ISO, focusing, and everything else that you want to do. So what you want to be looking at when you look through the viewfinder is be looking at where the shutter speeds and where the apertures are, making sure that they're appropriate for the situation that you are shooting. One of the great things about the program mode is that you have something called program shift. And so this is where you can adjust the specific shutter speeds and apertures that are being set by turning the front dial. If you turn the back dial, you can do exposure compensation. Let's take a look first at the program shift. All right, so let's go ahead and press the mode button and turn our camera over to the program mode. And just to make sure, I'm gonna make sure that our ISO is at just at a simple basic setting right now. It's at 120, 100. And so the camera's in the program mode. And if I turn the main dial on the camera, you can see over here that it is changing both shutter speeds and apertures at the same time. And anytime I take a photo, the camera is just figuring the light out and giving me a normal exposure. If I wanna turn the back dial of the camera, you can see how this makes it lighter and darker. So let's talk about exposure compensation here for just a moment. So the idea here is that the camera will adjust the exposure so long as it has control of one of the features. And in the program mode, it actually has control of both shutter speeds and apertures. And so it might change one, it might change the other. It's not too specific about which one it changes. All it's trying to do is to take a picture that's a little lighter or a little bit darker than the previous one. And so if we look on the back of our camera, our camera is currently at zero. If we wanted to take a couple of photos, kind of do a manual bracketed images, let's go ahead and do, we'll do a minus two stops, minus stop, normal exposure, a one, and a two. And if I go ahead and play these back, let's see if I can get some information here um, with the info button. You'll see that I'm at plus two, plus one. There's our normal exposure, no markings indicated, and minus one and minus two. And so if we wanted a different version of our image that was a little bit brighter or a little bit darker, we could do that. Most important thing to remember about exposure compensation is to reset it back to zero when you are done because you do not want to leave it at plus two all the time. That's a serious mistake a lot of photographers have made. All right, so the program mode is pretty good when you just want real simple exposure systems and you're not too particular about your shutter speeds and apertures. Just keep an eye either in the viewfinder or at the bottom of that LCD screen on the back to make sure that the shutter speeds and apertures are appropriate for the type of situation that you're shooting in. All right, next up is the time value, also known as the shutter priority mode. This can be good for situations where you know you need a specific shutter speed. Like if you need a thousandth of a second to stop the motion of an eagle grabbing a fish out of the river, you choose a very fast shutter speed. If you're photographing a river and you want to slow the motion and blur that water that's moving down the river, you could use a one second shutter speed here. And this is where the camera is going to figure out the rest of the equation using the aperture. Now this is not one of my favorite modes and there's a bit of a problem with the time value shutter priority mode in the camera, and that is, is that you can easily select a shutter speed that was not within the range of what's acceptable for the lighting that you're working in. And so there'll be a blinking 
aperture to warn you that your aperture is not wide enough for that particular situation. Let's go ahead and take a look on the back of the camera here. We've got to get our camera first off, changed over to the time value mode. Go ahead and sit, hit set. And so let's go ahead. I'm going to do just a little thing here where I am going to bump up the ISO just so that it can work a little bit easier in our current environment. All right, so now I've got shutter speeds, and let's say I want to set a shutter speed of a 60th of a second. All right, fine, not a problem at all. The camera says you need F10, sets the exposure just fine. Now let's say we need a shutter speed of 2,000th of a second. The camera is blinking F4.0, letting me know that F4 is not good enough. I'm still allowed to take a photo, and it's going to be a very dark photo compared to my previous one there. So this is something that you do need to be aware of when you are shooting in this mode. And so the two solutions, one is to back off until it stops blinking. So at these curtain settings with these lighting, I can go to 500th of a second, or I could leave it at 2,000th of a second, and I could change the ISO, which is back here with this dial right here. Um, and so just be aware that anything blinking is a potential problem and you want to pay close attention to any of those warning signs. Next up is the aperture value mode. This is one that I find very useful and I like quite a bit. Uh, you can also accomplish within flexible value, but if you like aperture value, it's a great system because here you get to decide, I need a particular aperture. I don't really care too much about the shutter speed because maybe I'm on a tripod or maybe it's just an appropriate handheld shutter speed but you can be very choosy about the aperture you choose and let the camera figure out the rest of the equation. You can have great depth of field or you can have shallow depth of field. And so with aperture priority, you generally don't have that problem that we had with time value because there are so many more shutter speeds that the camera can choose. Let's go ahead and give this little experiment on the camera. We'll press down on the mode button, turn over to the aperture value mode. Now, we have an aperture of 5.6, and the camera is figuring out the exposure just fine. As we change our aperture up here, excuse me, uh, with our main dial, we can choose any of our aperture settings, and the camera just selects a different shutter speed, and there's more than enough to choose from. If I was to change the ISO down to 100, does it still have the range? Well, at F4, we're at 25th of a second. That's pretty good. If I want to close all the way down to F22, it's 1.3 seconds, so got to be a little bit careful, need a tripod for that sort of situation, but you don't get the same warnings that you would normally get in the time value mode. So I find it a little bit safer and easier to use, and if you're watching your shutter speeds as you change your apertures, you can kind of really get your camera fit for almost any type of scenario very quickly and very easily, and so it's one of my favorite quick, easy modes for using on the camera. All right, next up is manual. This is where you get to set shutter speeds, apertures yourself, you get full control of the camera. The reasons that I like to shoot in manual exposure is number one, for consistent results. Under consistent lighting, I'm gonna shoot a bunch of different photos with different compositions and different focal lengths perhaps. I want the same proper exposure on all my images. And this means the camera's not gonna change something behind your back or while you didn't notice and getting a result that you weren't expecting. It's also great when you have tricky lighting. In situations where you have light that is either brighter or darker than normal, uh, these can be situations that can fool the camera's light meter and cause it to do things that you didn't want. And so for these two reasons, I encourage you to shoot with manual exposure when you can so that you get consistent results in all situations. So let's go ahead and dive in and change things around in manual. So press down on the mode button and we can go over to the mode. Now, looking a little dark to me. How about you? Yeah. Okay, so what are we gonna change here? Well, I'm gonna say that we can change this to a little bit lower of a shutter speed. I'm on a tripod, so I'm gonna go down to a 30th of a second. Now, as far as the aperture, we can set our aperture anywhere we want. We could open up quite a bit. I like a little bit more sharpness right now, so we're gonna set it to F8. I'm gonna do the rest of the equation with the ISO, which is this final dial here. 
And so I'm gonna adjust this, press halfway down on the shutter release to see where my exposure indicator is here. And in theory, you wanna get this right in the middle. All right, that's proper exposure for average tonality subjects. But my subject is a little bit lighter. This is a little white cabinet, so I'm gonna do a little bit over to the plus side, plus two thirds of a stop. And I think that's about the perfect exposure in this particular situation. Now, this will vary according to the light and what your subject is a little bit, uh, but you can very easily change your shutter speeds and your apertures, keeping an eye on your exposure indicator and probably starting off at zero and then making any subtle adjustments you need from there on out. And so that's the key in working in manual, which is probably still gonna be my favorite mode on this camera for quite some time. Um, I'm gonna probably try to use that flexible value more and more because it essentially has manual built into it. Uh, but if you know you don't wanna change anything to automate it, uh, then the manual mode will work just fine. Next up is the bulb mode. So this is a special long time exposure mode. This is where you get to leave the exposure open as long as you want. and you will be changing the aperture by either turning the back dial or the front dial on the camera. And the idea is, is that you need a shutter speed longer than the standard 30 second exposure in this camera. And so if you wanna leave it open for two minutes to get the light trails from the cars, yes, this is what will do the job. And so if you wanna do this, the idea is that the shutter will stay open as long as you are pressing on the shutter release of the camera. And so in theory, that's how it works, but in practice, that's not what you wanna actually do because when you press down on the camera, that's gonna probably cause some vibrations with the camera and would not be a good thing to do. So this is where you wanna hook up one of the cable releases or different types of wireless remotes so that you can do this without actually touching the camera in what it's doing. Now, one of the things we'll talk more about in the menu section, but I'll hint to you right now, is that you can go in and set up a very particular time for the bulb mode. If you wanna leave it open for three minutes and 27 seconds, you can just enter that time in shoot menu number six under bulb timer, and it will stay open for that exact period of time. And this is gonna be really handy for people who do nighttime photography. You don't have to keep pressing down on a shutter release for a particular amount of time. You can if you want to, if you're trying to time something, but if you just know how long it is, you can just dial it in straight to the camera and put the camera maybe in the self-timer mode, and that way nothing touches the camera during its exposure. If you do want to use one of the remotes, here are three different remotes, a standard wired one, an infrared one, and a Bluetooth one. I'll talk more about these as we go through the class. Next up are some very fun customization modes. And so C1, 2, and 3 are ways for you to customize your camera so that it works in a particular way when you dial that setting in on the camera. And so when you dive in to setup menu number five, you'll be either able to register your settings, you can clear them, or you can do an auto update where it takes the new settings that you have changed on the camera. So let's go ahead and let's set in a custom a couple of custom modes here. So we need to get our camera adjusted first. So for our first mode, I'm gonna to go to aperture value and I'm gonna set an aperture of F8 and I want an ISO of 400, okay? Now there's some other things that we could go in and change. You could change the focusing mode, uh, the image quality and other things. But for now, I'm just gonna keep it at this and I'm gonna hit the info button just to cycle through till we get to this screen. So the first mode is aperture value F8 ISO 400. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna dive into the menu and I'm gonna work my way over to the wrench and then I am going to dial over to page five and come down to shooting menu and I'm gonna register these as C1. Okay, it's now locked in. All right, so now I'm gonna go back to this mode and I'm gonna change the camera over to the time value mode. And in this case, I want a time value of a thousandth of a second and I want an ISO also of a thousand and we'll call that good. Well, there's other changes. We could change all these other features down here, but we're not gonna do it for right now. And we're gonna register this into C2, okay. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna change my camera back to the manual mode, where I like to have it frequently, and I'm gonna put the ISO 
back down at 100. And we'll change the aperture to shoot wide open here at 1 60th of a second. Okay, so here I am in manual. And if I want to change over to C1, you can already see that it's in the AV mode and already set to F8. Press this again. It's immediately in time value with an ISO of 100. All right, so I hope you can see the benefits of this is that you can have essentially four different settings. You can have one, the one that you're just generally in, and then the three other favorited ones that you've saved in there. And if you are a landscape photographer, you can have all your landscape stuff in custom one, but you also do bird photography, that can be in two. You occasionally do people photography, so that can be in three. So all those customized settings, and there's more than just the exposure ones, the drive ones, the focus ones, there's image parameters. You can have one set for black and white photography and have it saved in the camera so that you don't have to go reset your camera up you know, through a dozen different features. And so that's one of the things that's gonna be a continuous drone of mine in this class, I'll try not to say it too much, is customizing the camera for your needs. There's lots of ways of doing it. This is one of the best because it encompasses so many different things. When you want to adjust your focusing point, your exposure system, your shooting parameters, the image look, the file type, all of those sorts of things, you can do that in here. And it's a great system to have, so I encourage you to take some time, sit down, get your camera set up in the ways that you think you want to do it, and register those settings. All right, so those are your mode controls on the camera. Hopefully you've figured out ways that you can use the camera that makes life easier for you. I encourage you to experiment with some modes that maybe you wouldn't normally do, uh, just to see if there's a value that you need to take a little bit of time to figure out see if it works for you. And so a lot of good options in here. One of the things is, is that it's got a lot of modes and a lot of you don't need all those modes. And so one of the things you can do in custom function number two is you can restrict the shooting modes, which means you can untick the box for that particular mode. Let's just say time value. You do not like time value at all. You're never going to use it. You've always hated it. You'll never use it go into restrict shooting modes, untick that box, and you won't even see it on the options. So when you're dialing past all of them, you won't need to do it. To start with, I leave them all checked off just because I want you to experiment. I want you to learn with your camera. But once you really get dialed in what you're doing, if you know you don't wanna accidentally end up in the bulb mode, you can uncheck the box and completely get rid of it. All right, the next topic is ISO. And so ISO doesn't have a particular button on the camera, but it is currently located with the multi-function options. And so by hitting the M FN button on the front of the camera, you will activate the multi-functions. You can then choose which function you want with that mode dial, and then you can choose the function of it as well with the back dial as well. So you can use multiple dials in there, and then you will use the main dial on the camera to make that change. And so let's go ahead and take a look at how this works in here. So it doesn't really matter which mode we're in right now, but I am gonna flip back to the manual. Actually, let's go to aperture value. That's a simple one right now. So if you hit the M FN button on the top of the camera, right next to the dial, go ahead and hit that. It's currently in the ISO mode. And so you can start changing the ISOs. If it wasn't here, you can turn this mode dial and you can select any one of the five options. And so there are five things that you can have in here. This back dial changes from one setting to the next, the same as the back dial on the camera here, or the mode dial, these do the same thing. There's overlapping controls. The one on the front is the one that actually changes it. And so for longtime Canon users like myself, if you wanna change the ISO, you just leave it at the ISO setting. You press it, you turn it, you press it again, well, you can press it again to jump through it, press the shutter release down, and you exit the mode. So you adjust it where you want, hit the shutter release, and you're out of there. And so it's incredibly easy if you're jumping back and forth with a particular feature that you can do it right here. And so with the ISO modes, you can see currently we can go up to 51,200, and then we have auto down below 100. So let's take a look at my little test. I always like to do a test on cameras to see how good they are at different ISOs. We'll enlarge this little section 
And like always the first page, there's not that much difference. These are all looking really good. Now the native sensitivity of this camera is ISO 100. If you want the least amount of noise, the greatest dynamic range, the best image quality from the camera, you wanna leave it at 100. There is a 50 setting. If you need to go lower, it does not have as much dynamic range. You lose a stop of light or so when you do that. And it's something I would use if I really needed a longer shutter speed, say perhaps we're doing a landscape photograph where I needed a waterfall and I wanted a longer shutter speed, I would use that. Most of the time I'll use 100, bump up as necessary from there as my needs with shutter speeds change. When we go into the higher ISOs, we take a close look at these. Well, it starts getting a little rough. Somewhere around the 6,400, 12,800, definitely by 25,000, it's starting to get a bit noisy in there. And so you try not to use them if you can avoid them, but it's probably better to have a noisy photograph than a blurry one. So always make sure that you're getting the shutter speeds you need and then bump up the ISO as necessary. And that's gonna work best in most cases. And so the ISO, uh, right there in the multifunctions, it's the first item. I think this is a pretty good place to just kind of leave the multifunctions, leave that mode in there. ISOs is something a lot of photographers change very quickly um, and frequently. It is something you can access in the quick menu. It's something you can also access in the full menu. You can also dedicate other buttons to doing that as well. But I think this button is a pretty good button for accessing that particular feature. Now, if you do want to dive into the menu under ISO speed settings, there are a number of other controls over the ISO. You can actually extend the range upwards a little bit into that high 100,000 setting. You can also set up the auto range as well as the minimum shutter speed. And we'll talk about all of that when we get to the menu settings for the camera. All right, next up, let's talk about the metering of the camera. This is how it reads the light coming in and there's some different patterns that you can get to. Now, in order to get this, you hit the Q menu and then you navigate in the quick menu to the option for metering in there. And so it's that little symbol that you'll grow used to once you're used to Canon systems. And so there's four different modes in here and let's talk about what each of these modes do. First up is evaluative metering. And this is where the camera breaks the scene up into 384 zones. And the idea here is that it's comparing lights and darks in different parts of the scene so that it has a good idea of where the correct exposure should be. And evaluative metering generally does a really good job. This is where I, as well as most photographers, leave their cameras most of the time from what I hear about other people doing, and it tends to do a really good job. So we could just leave here and move on, but real quickly, let's talk about the other modes. Next up is partial metering. It's a centered area. It's not quite spot, it's not center weighted. It's kind of in between in size. It's 6.1% of the viewfinder. And if you wanted to read the light in the central portion of the scene, this would be a good one. It wouldn't read in all the extra areas around the edges. We do have a spot metering, which I think is the second most useful one here. You do have to be very careful with spot metering because it's measuring light in a very small area. But if you wanted the camera to read a particular subject and not all the stuff around it, this would be a good one to work with. Traditionally, center weighted was the most common on cameras. This was decades ago, uh, but some people still like using it. It's a very simple system. It's just a big old circle right there in the middle of the frame. And so it kind of disregards things that are far off to the left and far off to the right. And there may be a reason for using it. I, I don't use it anymore, but there, it's still on there, I think, for legacy reasons. But the evaluative metering is the one that I think a lot of people are gonna get the biggest bang for uh, because it's just good in so many different situations. It's pretty rare that you'll ever get a shot that is not usable when you're working with evaluative metering. Next up, let's talk about the histogram. So one of the great ways of judging if you've got the right exposure with a digital camera is to review the image and check out the histogram. When you look at the actual image, it may be hard to tell if you got all the information you need. So if you hit the info button, it'll cycle through different screens of information and one of those screens will show you the histogram. Um, this is right live as you're looking through the camera, pointed at your subject, you'll see the histogram changing. 
and so forth. And so there are some parameters that you can set if you want to dive into shoot menu number seven for controlling the histogram display, the brightness or RGB version of it, and how big it is in the frame. But this is a great way to judge your exposure. Uh, we're not going to go into the basics of photography, but real generally, a mound to the left means you're underexposed, and a mound to the right means you're overexposed. Generally speaking, a mountain in the middle is pretty good, but there's a lot of wide latitude to that philosophy. When you take an image, you can hit playback, hit the info button again, and you can cycle through different screens. And this is where you might see the brightness histogram, which is just all of the pixels combined together showing you where they are in an exposure. Are they left? Are they dark? Or if they are on the right-hand side, they're bright. Now, you can also scroll up and down with the little joystick, and you can get to an RGB histogram, which gives you a little bit more specific information about the different color channels and whether you're clipping or overexposed or underexposed on one of those channels. This can be particularly important when you are photographing very vibrant colors. It can also be important in portrait photography where skin tones, you don't want to make, you want to make sure that they're not overexposed. And so this is a great way for judging that you have the right exposure. If it's a little too mounted to the left or mounted to the right, adjust one of your exposure controls to get it a little bit more towards the middle of the range uh, for a proper exposure. It's a very easy system. I think the histogram should replace the traditional metering system. It's got so much more information. We can see where most of the information is. We can see where the highlights and the shadows and the black points are. Whereas the metering system that we currently have in cameras and that little exposure indicator is trying to narrow everything down to one little point that works back and forth. And so if it looks good in a histogram, you've got the right exposure. Another tool that some people use, not everyone, is auto exposure lock. And there's a little button on the back of the camera, the asterisk button. And this does auto exposure lock, but it can also do flash exposure lock. We're not working with flash today, but let's take a look at this and see how we might use it. So our camera is currently in aperture value, which is perfect for this. We'll hit info so that we can see what's going on here in front of us. Let's frame up a little bit more loosely right now. And so if we press down, our camera is recommending one sixth of a second. Let's go ahead and bump that ISO up so that we're dealing with a more reasonable shutter speed here. Okay, so we are at one two hundredth of a second. And if we move over a little bit to the right, our exposure changes. And so now it's down to a hundredth of a second. And so it depends on what it's looking at as its exposure. But if we said, you know what, this is the correct exposure, you'd press the star button right up here. And you'll notice the star comes on right here in the back of the camera. And that's locked in our exposure of one two hundredth of a second. And so now that it, it doesn't change. And so let's go ahead and try this up close. So if we say we want 1 200th here, but we want it framed over here, you can see how it's throwing it down to 1 50th of a second. Come here, press halfway down on the shutter release to keep things active, lock it in. I can now reposition over here and take the photo and it stays locked in at that 1 200th of a second. So the way that you might use this in the real world is let's say you're going to photograph a person who is standing beside a big window, and that window is throwing off the exposure. You pan the camera away from the window, you lock the exposure in, recompose, so it's got this big bright background that the camera is now ignoring, it's already got the exposure locked in, and then you can get the proper exposure for that situation. Now, there are some people that don't use that feature. There's other ways of accomplishing that. You can do exposure compensation, you can do manual, uh, a couple of other ways. But if you don't use it, well, this is a button that you can reprogram on the camera to do something else that you might like. And so we're going to be talking about reprogramming buttons. And this can become a secondary focusing button that does something different than the other buttons on the camera, which I think is a very handy trick. All right, next up, let's talk about exposure bracketing. Now, we talked about uh, changing the exposure with exposure compensation before, but if you want the camera to do it automatically for you so that you don't have to go through the process that we went through, you can have the camera automatically roll through a number of images where it is underexposing and overexposing so that you end up with a collection of images 
that either you're going to pick one image from or you might use the whole group of them to work with in an HDR processing program outside the camera afterwards. And so you can work with this in any of the modes where the camera has some control over the exposure. So program, time value, and aperture value. Now there are some tweaks that you can make to this. You can choose a specific number of frames and that'll be chosen in the custom function menu. You can choose the increments that they are in either from one third stops to three stop increments. And you can also use this with exposure compensation. So let's go ahead and do a simple bracket series right now. We're not going to dive into the full menu. We'll cover that a little bit later. So let's just back off here on our subject. And if we want to do this, we're going to go into the menu and we're going to dial on over. Let me take the long way here. And exposure compensation here. So what we can do is if we turn Let's do the back dial first. This is our exposure compensation. This is what we talked about before. And what I did essentially was I took a picture at two, minus one, zero, one, and two. If we turn this front dial, the camera is currently set up for a three stop bracket. Let's make it a significant bracket. Let's do one and three quarters. These are little third stop increments. One third, two thirds, full stop, one stop, and a third, one stop, and two thirds. So we're gonna set this up at one stop and two thirds. We can see the three dots along the top. That means it is currently set. And we'll take one, two, three photos. And I'll play them back. And you can see down here in the bottom, this is my one and two thirds overexposed image, my one and two thirds underexposed. And the first one is the normal one. Now, a quick little cheat for some of you is I'm gonna go into the quick menu and I am going to change, where is it that I want to change this? Now I'm just going to leave that normal. I want to go to my motor drive mode, my motor drive mode here, and I'm going to turn it into the continuous motor drive. Let's go back to the menu, make sure that we're still in the bracketing mode. We are still in the bracketing mode. And now I'm going to do the same bracket. Well, actually, I'll do something different just to make it different. We'll do a two thirds of a stop bracket. And now, because I put the camera in the motor drive mode, I will press down on the shutter release and I will leave it down continuously. And the camera will shoot off three shots and it will stop because it knows it's only supposed to shoot three stops. All right, here we go. Three, two, one. Stopped after three shots. Let's look, see if it did the right thing. Here's our two thirds overexposed, under two thirds, and our normal one. Okay, so. I'm not particularly fond of the fact that it shoots the normal one first and then a dark one and then a light one. That just seems a little bit odd, but this is something that we can adjust when we get into the custom settings of the camera. So there's a lot of things that we can adjust, the number, the range apart they are, um, the order that they're shot in. And so uh, there's some great controls in here. And so for those of you that are doing HDR photography, or if you're unsure about an exposure situation, you've got just this fantastic landscape scene and it's got unusual lighting. It's got a wide range of lighting and you're not sure. One of the safest things you can do is just shoot three or five or more images to really cover the entire range so that you have all the information so that you got it when it was good and then you can deal with it later on at home. And so it's a great system for making sure that you are getting the correct exposure, something that will work for what you need later on. All right, now the camera does have high dynamic range mode built into the camera itself. And this is where the camera will shoot with multiple exposures and combine them in camera for you. Now, I'm not a huge HDR expert. Shot a lot, but I'm not a guru on it. What you do in the camera is limited compared to what you can do in the software. The software is just more powerful, there's more options, and so if you really wanna do HDR right, shoot a bracketed series, get appropriate software that works for what you wanna do, and work with it in there. If you wanna test it out, if you wanna play around in the field, this is what we're talking about. It does have it here in the camera. It can work with images that are shot one stop, two stops, or three stops apart. Next, it has some effects. Not so fond of these. This is where it adds a particular look to the image. And some of them are a little bit funky, but we'll take a look at them. 
Um, but most importantly, first off, is this exposure range. And so how big of range are you dealing with? Uh, one stop isn't that big, so a lot of times most people would use two stops or three stops uh, when you're adjusting the dynamic range. And so in this particular lighting setup, I've got the Queen of Clubs uh, in the upper apartment that has more light, and in the lower apartment is the King of Clubs, and you can't really see down there because there's not much light. And you can see that the HDR system is allowing more light the higher you have it set. Now, when it comes to those effect modes, this is where it really kind of plays around with the tonality of things. And in this HDR mode, what the camera's doing is it's trying to bring down the brightness of the subject on the top, and it's trying to bring up the brightness of the subject on the bottom. And there's a lot of different algorithms that the camera can use in order to how do you mesh those two things together because there's a very big difference between the brightness on the top and the bottom. And as you move across how they interact with each other and what's gonna look good. And they have a lot of different options in here because there's a lot of different situations in which you might wanna use this. And so this is, this is an experimentation project for you. And so go ahead, shoot all these, see if there's any of them you like, um, and, and use them if necessary. I mean, it's a great way to get stuff right out of the camera that gets you what you need maybe. So also in here is we have continuous HDR. This is uh, the idea of, are you shooting this once and done with the HDR? Or are you on an HDR rampage where you are shooting everything in HDR? Uh, you don't wanna have to go back in and keep turning it on. And so this is whether the camera turns it on or turns it off um, once you're done shooting that HDR series. Auto image align is an important one to know about. So this is designed for hand-holding HDR. Now HDR from a strict expert's point of view, you should be on a tripod because you're gonna be taking multiple images. They should all have the exact same framing so that you can mesh these images together. If you do wanna do it handheld, you can put the camera auto image align enable. The camera crops in a little bit and then it matches up the images as best it can. And so it's best not to use this and use it on a tripod, but if you are gonna be handheld, then you need to turn this one on. Now, as far as saving the source images, yes, please, you do wanna save the source images just in case the camera doesn't do what you want it to do. Um, and so in this case, the camera will shoot three raw images if you have the camera set to raw, and it will combine that into a finalized JPEG, which may work for your final purposes, but just in case it doesn't work, wouldn't it be nice to have those original three raw images so that you could deal with it? If you're just playing around and it's just for fun and you don't wanna waste memory, yeah, I could see just keeping the HDR image, but if it's important, you wanna save all images. All right, there you go, folks. Tons of exposure controls on this camera. Hopefully you found a few new ways and a few new tricks that you can employ out there, making sure that you get the proper exposure.